Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. I'm Carla Roslin, a co-founder of the Global Immunotox, and it's an absolute pleasure to join you today and introduce our speaker, Professor Dr. Mala Maini. So Professor Mala Maini is a professor of viral immunology in the <clears throat> Institute of Immunity and Transplantation in the Division of Infection and Immunity at UCL London. Uh, she's also an honorary consultant physician in the Viral Hepatitis Clinic. Mala's lab studies adaptive immunity in various settings, from hepatitis B to liver cancer and also SARS-CoV-2, with the goal of informing on the development uh, towards immunotherapies and vaccines in those uh, major uh, causes of morbidity and mortality. I think we are ready for a fabulous talk, particularly for our audience that is very interested in human immunology, as Mala's research centers a lot on very well characterized patient cohorts and human tissue samples. So I think that's going to be an interesting aspect of the talk. Uh, the lab is particularly interested in dissecting and harnessing tissue resident immunity in the frontline uh, you know, of surveillance to, as I said, viruses and cancer. Given the outstanding work, uh, it's not a surprise that my nasal, um, Mala sorry, lab is funded by various um, sources. And in particular, I would like to highlight the Wellcome Trust, and the Cancer Research UK and the Royal Free Charity. So I'm sure we are ready for a phenomenal talk entitled Tissue T-cells Live in Lockdown in Liver and Lung. Now, before we start, uh, we like to get to know our speakers a little bit better. And I understand that Mala really enjoys uh, mentoring and supporting her lab members. So today uh, we would love to learn more about your perspective on mentoring and maybe if you can share your experience. Thanks for yeah. joining us. Well, thank you so much for the uh, invitation. It's fantastic to be here with you. Um, yeah, mentoring is really something which is taking up an increasingly large proportion of my time. Um, and luckily, I do very much enjoy it, right from, you know, helping out a brand new undergrad student who's joined the lab for a few months and needs to learn how to, um, you know, present their data and write it up, to supporting my senior postdocs to obtain their own fellowships and set up their own labs, which I've been fortunate to be able to do um, successfully quite a few times recently, which has been amazing. Um, I think, you know, it's, I, I'm just really interested in people and different personalities. Um, and that's one of the big joys of this job is that we get to work with such lovely, dedicated, intelligent people and just finding ways of supporting the different personalities um, to, to get the most out of them and to help them believe in themselves and find different ways through this challenging career. I think, you know, so often it, people have sort of preconceived ideas about what you have to do to succeed and just pointing out that the actual we've all been through many, many failures and many mm -hmm. points where we may have been even ready to give up in this career. And it's really all about persistence and resilience. Um, and also, you know, the fact that there's actually many different ways to, to progress through this career. You don't have to move into a fellowship at a certain point or move abroad at a certain point. You really have to follow your own instincts about what's best for your whole life. Um, so, you know, as a, as a mother of children, I, I do obviously a lot of mentoring as well of people who are having to balance, you know, a clinical career, a research career and a family and trying to, to think what, so what works for you is, is the most important thing. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective and your experience, such an important aspect of what we do. And I appreciate how you mentioned about the personalities, right? And how we also should learn to adapt to be the best mentor for as many people. Yeah, as I think, you know, as you, as you get more advanced in your career, like me, you start to see the people that you've trained, then passing on um, some of that ethos that you've tried to instill in them to the people that they're training. And you can see that, you know, it's really a way that you can have a big impact on the future. 
That's so, yeah. That's lovely. Well, so we are ready to learn from you today. So if you can share your screen, mm -hmm. we can get started. Perfect. Okay. Is that all right? Yes. Great. Okay. So this is where I work now. It's a brand new translational immunology institute in, in North London, next to the Royal Free Hospital, with a mission of really um, doing uh, translational immunology. And um, our lab is very much focused on uh, tissue resident immunity, mainly T cells with a bit of also B cell immunology. Traditionally, we've uh, worked on the liver, but more recently, we've also moved into the lung. And so I'm going to give you a taste of, of both aspects of our work today. So um, the impetus for concentrating on liver immunology really came from my background working in hepatitis B. Um, and um, this is obviously a, still a major global killer where there's a lot of interest now in trying to harness the immune response as well as giving potent new antivirals to try and bring those two types of therapy together to achieve a functional cure. Uh, and similarly, in liver cancer, there's a, a big move towards immunotherapy, which works well only in a small proportion of people at the moment. So trying to understand the pathways and find new targets um, is a, another increasing area of focus for us. So really, to sum up the, the goal of the lab now, I would say it's really trying to work on optimizing frontline defense against both pathogens and tumors. Um, so for the liver part of the work, um, APSI critical to that is our access to human liver tissue. And it's over many years that we've built up the collaborations through my, my own clinical colleagues and particularly through the organization TAPB at the Royal Free Hospital to get regular access to um, from, from surgical samples of perfusates, biopsies, explants, resections. Um, and over many years, we also had paired blood and biopsies from hepatitis B and now hepatitis C patients. So that, that's a, a, a big labor of love, both the people who helped to collect the samples, but also um, the fantastic juniors in the lab who stay till all hours processing this tissue. So I just want to give a, a shout out to all of the, the work that goes on behind the scenes to do this type of immunology. And um, I don't know if, can we get rid of the... Tell me what you need. Let's see. I just was hoping to only have myself in the corner so we can see a bit more of the screen. Okay. At the moment I can see MD yeah, and you. Okay. Um, so I'll try to sort of adapt my slides so that it would, they would be visible apart from the little top right hand corner. Does that work better? I can still see three boxes, but maybe that's only on my screen. Yeah, I think it's on your screen. Okay. If you can minimize. I was really screen. hoping to this this slide should show a picture of Nora Pallet from my group, does, who, who, um, who is now um, an independent investigator at the same institute and who really led this work on tissue resident T cells, identifying for them for the first time in the human liver um, and um, showing that in line with their, their characteristic ability to provide very potent frontline immune surveillance, being poised at the site of infection and able to mediate rapid effective function, we showed that they were inversely, their numbers were inversely proportional to viral control in hepatitis B patients, suggesting that they're uh, providing an important um, uh, sentinel protective role. Um, and another characteristic feature of tissue resident T cells is the capacity to have long lived progeny. And we were able to examine this again in the human liver using HLA mismatched transplants. So, one of the characteristic features of the liver is its highly tolerogenic nature. And so, um, liver transplants are routinely done without HLA matching. And by taking advantage of that, we could track. Um, donor-derived T-cells in transplanted livers that were removed for a variety of reasons, months or years after transplant. Um, and using the HLA type of those donor T-cells, we could show that some of them persisted for more than 10 years after transplantation, even though the majority actually of 
the tissue resident pool had been replaced by the recipients T cells, which could also then acquire some features of residency. Um, so this is a, a population which seems like a very uh, attractive target for immunotherapy because it, it's, as I said, ready at the site of infection to immediate rapid, infe uh, rapid effector function and uh, has the potential to be long-lived. <clears throat> However, we're increasingly looking at um, the interactions between different cell types within the liver where many different cells are brought into very prolonged and close proximity with each other due to the liver vasculature. Um, and one of the other cell types we've had a long-standing interest in is NK cells. And we and others also identified um, a human liver resident NK cell subset marked by um, CXCR6 and a particular transcriptional profile. So um, work that we've done over a number of years has shown, and, and this has also been shown again by other groups, that NK cells are not only cells that are able to mediate direct killing of viral infected cells and tumors, but they can also potently regulate CD8 T cells, either by um, killing them or by inhibiting them. Uh, or on the other, conversely, they can also actually boost CD8 T cells by production of uh, cytokines like interferon gamma. Here you can see um, a plaster cast of the uh, vasculature within the human liver, just emphasizing that the very fine meshwork of vessels that cells have to pass through when they come into the liver um, and the very narrow lumen of those uh, sinusoidal um, uh, sinusoids. Um, and here you can see actually some staining that Demetra Pepper did when she was working in my group, uh, showing NK cells and CD8, CD3 T cells coming into very close proximity within these sinusoids. So one of the big goals, um, as I mentioned at the beginning in hepatitis B, is to use um, immunotherapeutic approaches to try and achieve a functional cure. And the backbone of a lot of approaches is therapeutic vaccination. It's been tried for a number of years and so far has not been successful. And the reason for that is that the T cell response in chronic hepatitis B is both depleted and functionally exhausted. And to try to rescue that response with a vaccine and boost it up to a large number of functional T cells has proven very, uh, very challenging. So we wondered whether one of the reasons why this might be failing is because of this regulatory activity of NK cells. And we wanted to ask this question here in this study, whether NK cells, um, through their ability to regulate T cells, were constraining their capacity to respond well to a therapeutic vaccine. And perhaps by interrupting that regulation, we could get a better response to therapeutic vaccine. So this work has been led by Mariana Din, who's a fantastic postdoc in the group, but the um, setting up of the model was also um, developed by Anna and Marian. Um, and, and the model was originally um, pioneered by Ola Protzer in Munich. And um, what we've studied in this, um, in this mass uh, experiment is um, the use of a hepatitis B vaccine that's actually been uh, developed by Ellie Barnes in Oxford. It's based on the Chadox backbone. And this vaccine, excitingly, is, is going into, is in phase two trials now in, in humans, um, and giving some exciting results. Um, so what we did in this experiment was to um, uh, get mice who, which are chronically infected with hepatitis B using an adenoviral vector. You can't naturally infect mice with hepatitis B. So there's various mouse models, which all have some limitations. Um, we use the adenoviral vector model. Um, and then um, we came in at day 20, once, once we'd established a chronic infection with hepatitis B with this um, therapeutic vaccine, which uh, includes all the major HPV antigens. And then what we examined was the impact of depleting NK cells using an anti-NK 1.1 antibody um, or, or two, uh, three and one day before um, the vaccine. Um, so here, what you can see is that um, Mariana's analyzed the T cells uh, able to recognize the envelope um, of hepatitis B virus, in this case, um, using a dimer, um, but she's also done functional assays. And these are the, the cells that are present in the liver. Um, so normally there's a very low frequency of these HPV specific CD8 T cells. Um, just depleting the NK cells doesn't impact that. Giving the vaccine only gives a slight increase 
Um, but it's only when you give both the vaccine and the NK depletion that you see a nice expansion um, of HPV specific CD8 T cells. And Mariana had the same um, results using functional readouts for interferon gamma producing T cells directed against both the envelope and the polymerase protein. So um, this, th these initial data suggested that you know, NK cells are clearly exerting a dominant negative regulatory effect. Um, and we found that um, this effect actually lasted for more than 60 days. So there was an enhanced response to therapeutic vaccination that was quite prolonged, but the NK depletion needed to be done before or shortly after vaccination and not delayed. Um, I can't show all these data because I want to show a few other stories as well, but there was no impact of NK depletion on unvaccinated or mock infected mice. And interestingly, the effect was restricted to the liver, suggesting that there was a mechanism in place that was being induced locally only in the HPV infected liver. Um, and so Mariana went on to do some um, experiments where she was able to show with adoptive transfer that it was the liver resident fraction of the NK cells that were mediating this um, uh, down regulation and depletion of um, HPV specific T cells. So the our next question was whether there could be some tractable pathway that we could identify mediating this interaction, because in terms of clinical uh, applicability, we wouldn't want to be uh, depleting all NK cells from patients at the time of therapeutic vaccination. So, um, sorry. Okay. Um, so what you can see here, hopefully, is that um, uh, what, what we found after a lot of different screening for different ligand and receptor pairs, that NK cells in the liver have a constitutive upregulation of PDL1, which you don't see on conventional um, recirculating NK cells. And then this um, PDL1 on the NK cells is even further induced in the presence of HPV infection. And conversely, the T cells in HPV infection, so the HPV specific, in this case, envelope specific T cells, um, only upon HPV infection in the mouse and not with the mock infection, up, highly upregulate PD1 expression. And we know this is also the case in the human liver because we and others have described very high levels of PD-1 on HPV specific T cells um, in the liver. So uh, we went on to do some functional experiments to show that there was preferential rescue of PD-1 high CD8 T cells after NK cell depletion, that PD-1 blockade essentially phenocopied NK cell depletion, and most importantly, PD-1 knockout CD8 T cells when adoptively transferred into the mice were resistant to NK cell inhibition. So um, this really identified PDL1 on NK cells in the liver as a, a key regulatory mechanism constraining the response to therapeutic vaccination. Um, but what we went on to show is that if you pre-activated those NK cells with a cocktail of cytokines that's frequently used now in, in the clinic, for example, in cancer trials, um, and then blocked their PDL1, you could really convert them into predominant helpers that were, in, instead of inhibiting the T cells, they were producing lots of interferon gamma, they, they were upregulating PDL1, but we were blocking that with an antibody. And they then were able to actually boost the number of HPV specific T cells, both in the mice and um, when we did some experiments using samples that we have from our patients with chronic hepatitis B. And we're now moving that work into the setting of cancer where cytokine activated NK cells are being explored in the clinic and uh, looking into how relevant blocking PDL1 on those NK cells will be to allow them to work in tandem with T cells in the setting of cancer. Okay, so now I want to move on to tell you about uh, recent work we've done on an immunoregulatory subset of liver T cells. So one of the really interesting areas in liver immunology is, is um, how the liver, which constitutively has this very immunotolerant state that I mentioned that you, allows uh, transplantation across MHC barriers, for example, uh, but then in certain circumstances can um, switch to mediate very powerful immunity. Uh, for example, many adults who get infected with hepatitis B very effectively control the infection. 
And of course, immunopathology can also result from chronic uh, hepatotropic infections and other insults to the liver. And one of the factors that's been uh, frequently identified as influencing the outcome of liver disease is the gut microbiome and potentially also the LPS content coming from that. Um, that's been shown, for example, to influence the progression of hepatocellular carcinoma. So um, we know that, that liver T cells then must be bathed in a lot of LPS uh, because they're receiving their blood not only from the hepatic artery, but also 80% of their blood actually comes from the portal vein directly from the gut. So they're really um, bringing in large quantities of both LPS, um, actually live bacteria even, and um, other bacterial products into the liver. And we wanted to ask whether T cells might provide some kind of mechanistic link between this um, gut LPS um, and liver disease. And now I'm, I'm going to tell you about this study, which again was, was led by Laura Pallet. Um, and uh, as you can see, lots and lots of help from many collaborators. And um, yeah, what I want to stress here from this lovely diagram that Laura made is, is again, this um, close interaction that you have um, in the liver with um, between liver resident T cells and many other cell types, including myeloid cells. So um, this really started when, when we um, noticed over a number of years that um, when we stained uh, CD8 T cells directly from the human liver, so this is samples that are coming out of the liver um, and being stained immediately ex vivo, um, we, we saw quite a lot of co-expression of CD14 on those CD8 T cells, which we weren't seeing on the paired samples from the blood. And you can see it's a very variable amount of expression, um, but it's almost always present on the liver CD8 T cells and virtually undetectable in the blood. So obviously the, the first concern with this was that it was some sort of artifact, a doublet or something like that. And so um, Laura did a, a huge amount of work to exclude that. Um, as you can see, um, these CD, we, we sorted these CD14, CD8 T cells and did cytospins with Mazhanifa and they look um, like normal T cells. They actually have also increased expression um, of TLR4 and MD2. So other components of the LPS receptor were also enriched on this CD14 positive fraction compared to the CD14 negative fraction in the same donors. But most importantly, we were able to show using image stream um, that the same single cells um, that expressed alpha beta T cell receptor and CD8 um, also co-expressed TLR4 and CD14. Then um, when I was presenting these data at a conference, um, I was approached by a, um, a colleague, Bertram Bench, who works in Freiburg um, in collaboration with Marco Prince. And he was very excited because he had seen a similar finding on his imaging mass cytometry of human liver sections. And here you can see that here that some of the CD8 T cells in the human liver by this technique also appeared to be co-expressing CD14 and were coming up as an independent CD14 expressing cluster here within the CD8 T cells. So um, when um, Bertram's group analyzed the localization of these cells, they found that they were in a different position from the typical CD8 infiltrate in the liver. So most CD8 T cells um, in the liver typically um, are in zone one um, in the periportal region, um, but these CD14 expressing CD8 T cells um, were seen throughout, but were particularly enriched in zone two, which is the um, mid lobular region um, of hepatocytes, which are important for maintaining um, hepatic homeostasis. Uh, and Bertram's group also noticed that the CD8 T, these CD8, CD14 T cells were in closer proximity to myeloid structures um, than, than their CD14 negative counterparts. So um, at this point, we had also had data um, through a collaboration with Mas Hanifa, which showed that the uh, sorted CD14, CD8 T cells had barely detectable levels of CD14 messenger RNA. And um, we were then starting to um, conclude that they must be acquiring the CD14 at the protein level um, and wondered if this might be happening from adjacent myeloid cells in the liver. 
And here we're now um, doing an in vitro experiment with Matt and Rule from UCL where um, T cells are either incubated alone or in the presence of monocyte derived macrophages and you can start to see them acquiring some of the CD14. But to nail this down um, more definitively, um, Laura worked with Anna Zurich at, at King's like to again use the image stream. So in this experiment, um, they labeled macrophages with biotin um, and then could identify um, any biotin that was transferred across from that macrophage membrane to T cells by labeling it with streptavidin. And so again, what you can see here, here's the myeloid cells with um, lots of CD14 on them and lots of streptavidin and co-expression. And then in some CD8 T cells, like the top two rows here, you can see that not only do the single cells express CD3 and alpha beta T cell receptor, but they've also um, co-acquired CD14 and streptavidin. Um, and um, actually, we then went on to show that they're not just acquiring the LPS receptor, they're requiring other molecules like, for example, here we can see that the streptavidin positive CD8 T cells have also acquired HLA-DR. So how was this happening? So Laura went on to do a series of experiments to try and um, get a bit of a handle on the mechanism. Um, it was a contact dependent mechanism because if you separated T cells and myeloid cells in, in culture by a transmembrane, you lost that acquisition of CD14. Uh, it was also um, dependent on actin. So um, inhibition of, of actin polymerization using lantraculin B um, abrogated the, acqui uh, the acquisition of CD14. And then thinking about um, molecules that might be involved in forming a synapse between T cells and myeloid cells, um, Laura blocked LFA1 ICAM interactions and again showed that that partially abrogated the acquisition of CD14 in culture. So we've been with wondering why, why does this only happen to a proportion of cells and why does it only seem to happen in the liver or in, at least in tissue? Because actually we have seen it happening in other tissues as well. Um, and we um, then wondered whether the local microenvironment might be promoting this, um, either by sort of physically tethering the cells together or perhaps by soluble factors. So um, we used um, liver fibroblasts. These are primary hepatic cellate cells that we isolate from large um, surgical samples that we get of liver resected tissue. Um, and we um, co-incubated the CD8 T cells and myeloid cells either with or without these stellate cells. And what you can see is that over time, in, instead of just acquiring a little bit of CD14, in the presence of the stellate cells, um, they really massively um, upregulate their um, expression of CD14. And this turned out to be dependent on uh, CXL, CXL12, CXCR4 axis. So when we blocked that axis, um, you lost the effect of the uh, stellate cell promotion. So these appear to be a, a type of T cell that's um, particularly intimately interacting with the stroma in the liver. And in line with that, when we go back to now analyzing directly ex vivo from the human liver, we see that the CD14 expressing fraction here in, in blue in all these diagrams uh, has higher levels of um, a lot of um, hemokine receptors and integrins that would position it within the stromal network of the liver. So they have high levels of CXCR3, CXCR4, high levels of the collagen um, binding integrins CD49A and B. Now, what do these uh, cells do? Um, are, are they, uh, are they, is CD14 acquired by a, a unique subset of CD8 T cells that have a particular uh, functional property? We don't think that's the case because we did um, TCR analysis um, with our single cell RNA-seq, and the clones actually looked very similar to the ones that we see in, in the CD14 negative fraction. Um, but more importantly, we wanted to know, you know, when these CD14 T cells acquire the LPS receptor, do they actually become responsive to bacteria themselves? Um, and perhaps this interaction with myeloid cells marked by CD14 actually um, really sort of identifies a cell that has had a whole a series of instructions from that myeloid cell. It could be antigen presentation, co-stimulation, cytokines or metabolites. 
So what is the functional um, property of a cell that has had this myeloid interaction? So first of all, again, this is all done directly ex vivo from the human liver samples. Um, and in every case, the CD14 positive fraction is in the blue compared to the, the white. So the, you can see that directly ex vivo, the CD14 expressing CD8 T cells are more proliferative with high levels of KR67, more activated with more um, CD38 and CD25. Um, but then going on to, oops, sorry, this is not advancing. Okay, I'm um, going on to look at their actual uh, functional role. Um, we noticed that they actually expressed um, very high levels of constitutive um, cytokines. So this is without any re-stimulation. Um, you can see that they're potently um, producing both IL-10 and IL-2 directly ex vivo. So it's suggesting that these CD8 T cells are helping to maintain this homeostatic state of immunotolerance in the liver at rest. Instead, um, what happens when they see bacteria? Well, first of all, there's some evidence that they can um, bind LPS by this um, assay here showing um, fluorescent labeled LPS um, binding to the, the CD14 expressing CD8 T cells. Um, but functionally, we could also show that um, if you look at the um, uh, function of these cells in a global manner, looking at the secretome, um, the unstimulated LPS, or sorry, E. coli stimulated and TCR stimulated uh, CD14 T cells really segregate quite separately. Um, so when these T cells are exposed to, we mostly use UV killed E. e. coli for these experiments, they, they actually produce a completely distinct um, functional profile with um, the production of hepatotropic cytokines like IL-6 and IL-33 and um, wound healing or chemotractive chemokines like IL-8, which you can see here in this example a facts plot where the CD14 positive fraction constitutively expresses IL-8, and this is further increased when they're um, incubated with UV killed E. coli, which we don't see in the CD14 negative fraction. Um, to take this one step further, we collaborated um, with Derek Gilroy's group um, and um, did these experiments actually with my brother um, to show that actually in vivo, we could also find evidence that E. coli was influencing the CD14 positive fraction of CD8 T cells. Um, so um, not only uh, in vitro, we, we found that when there was incubation with the UV killed E. coli, the proportion of CD14, CD8 T cells really expanded, suggesting that the um, bacterial exposure could promote this acquisition, probably by activating the myeloid cells. Um, but also in this experiment where um, donors had um, blisters raised on their forearms, and in one case, uh, in one arm, um, UV killed E. coli were injected 24 hours before the blister was raised. In the other arm, there was no E. coli. And then from those blisters, you can suck out cells from the local immune response. So it's a way of studying a local immune response to E. coli in vivo. Um, and in the arm where um, there'd been a prior exposure to E. coli, we saw again this increase in expression of CD14 expressing CD8 T cells summarized here. And that this, this expansion was restricted to the blister cells and not seen in the blood. So again, in line with this idea that this is a tissue compartmentalized effect. So that's summarized here saying that, you know, these cells at rest are constitutively immunoregulatory. Upon exposure to LPS, they switch to producing a different set of um, chemokines and cytokines, which may be important for uh, chemoattracting bacteria or acting as alarmins. But what about when they're, when they're seeing a, a cognate antigen through their T cell receptor, uh, a viral peptide or tumor antigen, for example? So um, here we, we found that, in fact, these cells are actually really super responders in terms of these type of antiviral, anti-tumor effectors. So they very potently produce interferon gamma, TNF, um, and cytotoxic molecules when they're stimulated through their T cell receptor. 
And um, we went on to show that this could be exploited for uh, T cell receptor gene therapy. So this is something I've been working on for many years in collaboration with Antonio Bartoletti and Hans Staus, developing um, TCR redirected T cells uh, with a T cell receptor that can recognize this um, hepatitis B envelope epitope, which is expressed on um, some liver cancers, which are secondary to hepatitis B. And we wanted to know, could we improve the efficiency of these T cells um, by co-incubating them with myeloid cells and allowing them to undergo this myeloid instruction process? So um, here, Laura's um, co-incubated these TCR redirected T cells with myeloid cells and then sorted the fraction that's acquired CD14 as a marker of having had that myeloid instruction. Um, and then tested their ability to kill um, a cell line which is expressing um, the hepatitis B surface antigen as a tumor antigen. So um, here's the, the measure of the lysis of those tumor cells and the one the, the fraction of these um, gene modified T cells that has acquired CD14 following that interaction is better at killing the tumor cells. Um, so, just to sum up this part of the talk, T cells um, expressing the LPS receptor might provide a new mechanistic link between the stromal myeloid network, bacterial LPS, and hepatic immunity. Um, the fact that we have these cells with unique effector potential compartmentalized within the liver, and actually we've also shown they're there within liver tumors like hepatocellular carcinoma means that um, there's a potential for bacterial LPS to directly modulate antiviral and anti-tumor T cells. Um, there's also the potential to use this myeloid instruction to reprogram T cells for more efficient adoptive cell therapy. And I think this study just reinforces once again the need to not just rely on blood sampling to understand um, immunology and to also monitor immunotherapy. We really need to also um, get a handle on the tissue immune landscape. And one way that we've been doing this, along with several other groups, is using fine needle aspirates, which are um, very thin gauge needles, usually used for spinal taps, um, which allow you to suck out um, uh, immune cells from the liver. Um, and now we're exploring that in liver tumors as well, um, and actually do pull out all the tissue resident cells and allow you to study them in a relatively uninvasive manner. Okay, so in the final part of this talk, I just want to briefly mention how we pivoted during SARS-CoV-2 to apply our interest in um, antiviral T cells and frontline tissue immunity to SARS-CoV-2. And this is work that was led by Leo Swadling, another brilliant postdoc who's again now got independent funding um, through fellowship to um, set up his own group also in the same institute. Um, and again, large number of um, collaborators are absolutely essential to this work. Uh, I'll try to mention many of them as I go through it, but I'm also going to end by briefly mentioning another study that was led by Mariana Diniz and Elena Mitzi, um, bringing it back to the tissue. So, um, we were very fortunate to uh, take part in this um, COVID sortium, um, which acted incredibly quickly. These colleagues um, shown here um, were able to uh, recruit 731 healthcare workers, um, and most of them were recruited in the first week of lockdown in the UK um, during the first wave of the pandemic. So these were people who were recruited before they had been exposed and during early exposure. They were sampled every week for 16 weeks after that with PCR, extensive serology. Um, and then what, what we found was that um, about 20% of them had lab confirmed infection by PCR and or serology. Um, but obviously the large majority of them, 80% remained seronegative. And um, what we then did is at week 16, we came back and um, therefore recruited a matched group of those who had lab confirmed infection and those who remained seronegative, trying to match them for gender, age, ethnicity, likely level of exposure at work. Um, and we also had access to an unexposed set of pre-pandemic PBMCs for comparison. And what we really wanted to ask here was, um, 
are these people who are remaining seronegative truly unexposed to the virus? But is it possible actually that some of them um, are somehow resisting a full-blown replicative infection? And so um, they, they're just not being picked up with these tests. So here's the, um, the way that we defined this seronegative cohort. So as I said, every week for 16 weeks, they remain negative on a PCR test, whereas the positive cohort all tested positive within the first um, five to six weeks. Um, they also had, um, in collaboration with um, Public Health England at the time, multiple serology tests. So for um, spike IgG, nuclear capsid IgG and IgM, um, they were negative every week for 16 weeks, but we it, it took it a step further. And in collaboration with Onion McKnight's group at Queen Mary, we, we did um, pseudotype virus and live virus neutralization assays at three time points. And there were a couple that were just above the cutoff that we excluded. So again, um, a very extensively well-characterized cohort that seems to be remaining seronegative despite having sort of equivalent levels of exposure to the virus at work um, as a group that's got lab confirmed infection. They also had um, no detectable um, spike specific memory B cells. So this was using um, spike baits made by Laura McCoy um, in the, that we had used for another study focusing on spike specific memory B cell um, activity. And um, what we saw was that again, in this, in this um, seronegative group, there were no detectable spike memory B cells. So it wasn't just that they had no antibodies, they had none of the memory B cells either. However, what I'm now going to show is that there were two independent pieces of evidence suggesting that a subset of these healthcare workers did actually have what we called an abortive infection, where they didn't become PCR positive, they didn't develop antibodies, but they did have evidence for infection. So the first bit of evidence is based on T-cell immunity. So first of all, um, you're looking at the samples that we pulled out of our liquid nitrogen from before the pandemic. Like many groups, we saw that there was some level of cross-reactivity to SARS-CoV-2. So here we're looking at um, interferon gamma, early spot data that um, Leo and others in the group generated um, using a, a number of different overlapping peptides spanning these different um, structural and non-structural proteins and summing up the responses here. Um, and there is a variable amount of T cell responses detectable even from samples from before the pandemic. But then when you instead look at this cohort that appear not to have been infected, you can see straight away that their T cells clearly are um, more numerous and more um, uh, multi-specific than the pre-pandemic samples. And in fact, the level of T cell response in this group looked equivalent to a group with a lab confirmed infection. And, and this is just summed up here um, numerically with the magnitude and breadth of total T cell responses against all these different peptide pools um, being seen to be significantly more in the seronegative healthcare workers than the pre-pandemic and actually um, equivalent to what we saw in lab confirmed infection. And the same holds true for the breadth of responses. So um, people were still quite skeptical. I mean, these data suggested to us that these individuals had um, expanded T cells because at week 16, we were seeing an increase in these memory T cell responses, um, despite the fact that they were seronegative and PCR negative. But we wanted another bit of evidence that they actually had seen the virus and had some kind of infection. And so um, in, in collaboration with Marina Sudegi, who was one of the people who set up COVID Sortium, uh, we looked at the levels of IFI 27 in these donors. So this is an interferon-inducible uh, biomarker of SARS-CoV-2 infection, which Maddie showed is very sensitive um, and is actually able to be detected often a week before PCR positivity. Of course, it's not totally specific for SARS-CoV-2 because it's just an interferon-induced signal. Um, it can come up in other viruses. But remember, at this time, because of lockdown, there were... No, no other um, really significant viral infections going around, certainly no other coronaviruses at that time. Um, and what we could see is that um, over the first five weeks of sampling from the time of lockdown, in the, in the group who had um, no antibodies but no expanded T cells, this signal remained flat negative in the, in the same range that we see in the pre-pandemic samples, 
Whereas in the group with the expanded T cells, um, this IFI27 signal was also coming up. And in almost all of them, it came up at one time point or other during the first five weeks. So we think that these data really support the idea that there's a, an alternative outcome to infection, which isn't typically included in the classical diagrams where you can have people who are unexposed, perhaps exposed, but totally uninfected, especially these days where you can have sterilizing immunity from vaccine induced antibodies or perhaps occasionally genetic resistance. Um, but instead, um, we've called this scenario abortive infection um, sort of to describe an infection where there's not adequate replicative infection to be detected by PCR or uh, to induce an antibody response. But what's important then was to ask, you know, do the T cells and these people who are able to achieve this highly efficient control of SARS-CoV-2 and to abort it in the earlier stages, do they look different from those T cells that you see in a, in a classical infection? And what I'm going to show you now is that actually they preferentially target the virus replication machinery, the replication transcription complex, which are the, the first viral proteins to produ be produced within infected cells. So when SARS-CoV-2 comes into the cell, um, it immediately translates from the positive strand genome, the, um, the replication transcription protein, which is shown here as NSP7, 12, and 13. Um, and that happens before the full viral replication cycle, which then results in the uh, translation of all the structural and accessory proteins. So it's conceivable that um, any pre-existing T cells might recognize an infected cell at the point where only these early replication transcription proteins are being um, translated and perhaps presented. Um, and what we, what we saw to, to support that idea was that um, when we look at T cells targeting that replication transcription complex, they're the ones that are specifically enriched in the group that stayed seronegative here in green. So they actually got more of these T cells than the group who had a classical infection and than the pre-pandemics. Whereas with the structural, they have sort of equivalent levels to the lab confirmed infection. And you can see this here for a number of different peptide pools spanning this replication transcription complex, particularly around NSP12, the viral polymerase, where in every case, the group that remains seronegative had more of these T cells um, at the memory response at week 16 than the group that had a classical infection. Are they being induced de novo though, or are they being boosted from, from pre-existing cross-reactive responses? Well, um, of course, we know that um, seasonal coronaviruses are very common, particularly in healthcare workers. Um, and we did then show that some of the responses that we were able to detect could cross-recognize cross human um, coronavirus variants. Uh, we would show that both by intracellular staining and by tetramidata. And importantly, there is very high sequence conservation across this region. So working with Francois Ballou and Lucy Van Dorp at UCL, um, we've examined this. And here you can see the um, degree of um, conservation sequence identity between SARS-CoV-2 and the four um, human seasonal coronaviruses. And straight away, you can see that over this region, the replication transcription complex, particularly the viral polymerase, there's high levels of conservation. Um, and importantly, there was also very um, low levels of diversity in this region uh, amongst all the different circulating SARS-CoV-2 clades. And this is held out for all variants of concern where NSP12, NSP13 um, remain um, highly conserved in all these variants. So um, this is the, the sort of key uh, experiment we were then able to do, which was to go back to baseline samples and show that in the healthcare workers um, who went on to remain seronegative, there was a higher pre-existing frequency of polymerase-specific T cells than in those who went on to lab-confirmed infection. And finally, um, we could then use paired samples from the early time point and the later time point to show that the polymerase-specific T cells um, were expanding in vivo. So in the same donors, we had pre and post likely exposure with an increase in frequency in polymerase specific T cells, whereas control T cell response in the same donors against other viruses remained at the same frequency. 
So just to sum up this concept, in a classical infection, you have a, a viral ramp up followed by induction of antibodies and T cells with a bit of delay. Whereas what we're suggesting is that if you have pre-existing memory T cells, um, they can then expand so rapidly in some cases, um, either due to cross-reactivity or due to reinfection, that they could uh, clamp down on the viremia before it really becomes detectable and before you get induction of antibodies. And for this to be uh, really working so efficiently, we hypothesize that you must have airway tissue resident T cells pre-existing because they need to be at the site of infection to work that quickly. And so um, through a, a fantastic new collaboration with um, Elena Mitzi, Daniela Ferreira, and now also with Kondwani Jambo, um, we were able to obtain bronchovular virus samples that Daniela had frozen down from before the pandemic. And um, what Marianne and Eleni showed was that um, actually in the, in the airways of these donors before the pandemic, there were T cells that could cross recognize all these different, um, again, SARS-CoV-2 viral peptides. And they were more, the T cells were more enriched in the airway actually than in the blood. And as you would expect, when you look at their um, phenotype, they were enriched within the tissue resident pool. So in the case of CD4s, we used um, CD69, and then for the CD8s, we could look at CD69 and CD103 and show that most of the responses had a tissue resident phenotype. So just to sum up this now, T cells appear to be important um, in the initial viral control phase, not just the typical role that we assign them of clearance to limit immunopathology. And this early response would be favored by cross-reactive T cells targeting the early express replication transcription complex. It's an important region because it's highly conserved across all variants and all animal coronaviruses. Um, we think that the early T cell shutdown activity requires pre-existing memory at the site of viral inoculation. Um, and we don't think that the existing intramuscular antibodies are able to induce that and expand that memory very well from new data that we and others are generating. So all of this really supports our new approach, which is to develop an inhaled vaccine um, targeting mucosal replication transcription T cells to hopefully be able to provide a cross-reactive protection against future variants or other animal coronaviruses. So that just leaves me to thank uh, huge numbers of people. So this slide is really to thank the people who are involved in the COVID sortium, COVID work. Um, and I've mentioned as we've gone along key people, Leo and Mariana, um, and many of the key collaborators who are shown here. Um, the whole many group also had a huge amount of help with processing um, uh, blood samples as did all these other groups who are listed here. Um, and then, sorry, oops, just to also, um, acknowledge everybody involved in all the other work I've shown, um, uh, particularly um, I pointed out Laura and Mariana again, um, all the fantastic people who have been and are still in my group and also in this now kind of extended group of other new investigators who are all working alongside me, um, all our collaborators and funders, big thanks to everyone. Um, and I hope to, to get some questions coming through. Thank you so much, Mara. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, so before we close, I would like to remind our audience how they can ask uh, questions. Uh, I'm sure this uh, fabulous presentation motivated a lot of thoughts. I appreciate your efforts in moving the fields forward and, and conceptually this concept of abortive infection and the improving findings that you share. It's really fascinating. So for all of you joining us, you can uh, search the Global Immunotalks account in X or former Twitter. You will find a tweet that says, ask questions for Dr. Mala Maini here. Please reply to that tweet with your question and do not forget to mention the hashtag Global Immuno. Mala is going to use her own um, X account at Maini Lab. So thanks, everybody. Thank you again for this extraordinary global immunotalk. And we look forward to joining all of you next week for another global immunotalk of 2024. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.